A little bit about our presenter. Melanie Tickus Bradley is a Washington, D.C. author and naturalist who leads field trips and tree tours for the Audubon Naturalist Society, the United States Botanic Garden, Smithsonian Associates, the Maryland Native Plant Society, the Rock Creek Conservancy, the Nature Conservancy, Casey Trees, Politics and Prose, and other organizations. She is the author of such books as Resilience, Connecting with Nature in a Time of Crisis, The Joy of Forest Bathing, Reconnect with Wild Places, and Rejuvenate Your Life, a year in Rock Creek Park, the wild wooded heart of Washington, D.C., and City of Trees, the complete field guide to the trees of Washington, D.C. A longtime contributor to the Washington Post and other publications, Melanie has appeared as an author and guest expert on NPR's All Things Considered, Morning Edition, The Diane Rain Show, and WAMU's The Kojo Namdi Show. In 2014, Melanie was awarded one of four inaugural Canopy Awards by Casey Trees for her efforts to educate people about the trees of Washington, D.C. Melanie is a certified nature and forest therapy guide. We're excited to have her here today talking with us about her latest book, Finding Solace at Theodore Roosevelt Island. Please take it away, Melanie. <laughs> Thank you so much, Libby. This is the next best thing to being in person <clears throat> to leading a walk on the Capitol grounds or in the U.S. Botanic Garden and the Outdoor National Garden. So I'm so happy to be here with all of you, and this is our new way of gathering, and it's our new way of nature lovers getting together here in the Washington area and all around the country to celebrate our, our mutual love of nature. And I hope I'm going to take you on a wonderful little journey today to this island that's in the middle of the Potomac River, in the middle of Washington, D.C., and it's just a magical place. <clears throat> I want to thank the photographers whose images I'm sharing with you today. Gary House is kind of the unofficial, or maybe the official photographer for Theodore Roosevelt Island. He has taken so many incredible photographs of the island. The great blue heron on the left and the pileated woodpecker on the right are both his photographs. I'm also going to be sharing uh, pictures by Anna Ka'ahanui, who is my wonderful friend and colleague, Susan Austin Roth, who goes way back with me to our days in Rock Creek Park. And then if you don't see a photo credit, that means it's one of my pictures that I took with my phone. <laughs> and <clears throat> this um, image in the middle is one of my favorite places on the island. It's a tidal inlet next to the swamp boardwalk. Now this is the new book, Finding Solace at Theodore Roosevelt Island. Um, <clears throat> and the artwork is by my dear friend, Tina Thimi Brown. Tina and I go back to our days at Sugarloaf Mountain when we worked on two books about the mountain. She did the artwork, I did the writing, and we spent 10 years researching these books. And we got together again to do the writing and the artwork for this book. Um, the cover is a girl kingfisher, a female kingfisher. If you're a birder, you know <clears throat> that the female kingfisher has that rusty belly band that identifies her as a female. And um, Tina, Tina told me that the uh, cover art for this book is color pencil and oil pastels. She also created this charming map that is in the book of the island. And then the kingfisher on the left is um, at every chapter head. The, the book is a, a year long um, uh, a memory of the island from July of 2016 to July of 2017. And at each chapter head, each new month, the, the kingfisher is there. I have to say, I started this book because of the kingfisher. I know this is gonna sound a little crazy, <laughs> um, but I was paddling along the east, uh, western shore of Theodore Roosevelt Island in July. I was getting ready to lead a kayaking tree tour for Casey Trees. And I was paddling along, it was evening, there was a crescent moon in the sky, the sun was setting. And as I was paddling along, this, this kingfisher was flying in front of me. And she would fly, she would land in a, in a tree up ahead of me, chattering away all the time. She dove for fish, she caught a fish, I think, I couldn't quite tell. And we paddled, I paddled along behind her all the way down almost to the Theodore Roosevelt Bridge. And then I had to turn around and go back to the Key Bridge Boathouse, which I didn't wanna do, I wanted to stay out on the river 
I could have stayed out there all night, but I had to go back to the boathouse. I turned my kayak around, and lo and behold, she turned around with me, and she flew with me all the way to the northern end of the island. And this made such an impression on me. I thought, I've got to write a book about this island and this kingfisher, so that's what I did. Um, a lot of you know me. We have spent time together in the field, especially at the Capitol grounds. Um, but for those of you who don't know me, um, I moved to Washington from northern New England many years ago with my husband, Jim, when he started law school. And I was looking for a job as a journalist. I had been the news director for a radio station in New Hampshire, and I thought I'd just kind of breeze into town and be the next Connie Chung. Um, and I know some of you remember Connie Chung very well, um, <clears throat> but that didn't happen. What happened instead is that I fell in love with the trees of Washington, and I found out that the nickname of the city is City of Trees. And here I was surrounded by all these trees that I couldn't identify. And it turns out, I mean, they come from all over the world. So I decided to write, write this book, City of Trees. And from there, I never turned back. I became a nature writer. These are my nature books. They're, they're here behind me on the mantle. Um, I've written seven nature books now. And this is my, you know, this is my love, my joy, is to spend time in nature, to write about it, and then to go out in the field with other nature lovers where we study the trees and the flowers and, and just have a wonderful time connecting with nature. These two photographs were taken on field trips by my friend Anna. And <clears throat> the one on the left is on the Capitol grounds. It's a cold spring day. You can see I'm wearing a winter jacket and the dogwood is, pink dogwood is blooming. I have been leading tree tours of the Capitol, which is officially an arboretum um, for many, many years. And we had to forego them this year, very sadly, and, and we hope to, to start doing them again. I've been working with Libby on these tours for many, many years. Um, and, and the Capitol grounds were designed by Frederick Law Olmsted Sr., who also designed Central Park. On the right, Anna took this picture as well. I'm on Theodore Roosevelt Island, leading a field trip for the Audubon Naturalist Society. I'm there with the Virginia bluebells blooming in the spring. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt Island was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. So there's nice continuity there. So I had been writing about nature, leading field trips for many years. And about five years ago, I heard about this thing called forest bathing. And when I heard the phrase, it immediately resonated with me and I got what it meant, which is just full immersion in the beauty and wonder of nature. So on a forest bathing walk, you know, unlike a, unlike a naturalist walk where you're talking about the plants, you're naming them, you're studying them, on a forest bathing walk, it's a little more meditative. It's, it's really kind of a mindfulness practice um, and it's a practice that started in Japan in the 1980s. Um, and it just really resonated with me because my favorite times in the field with other people are not so much when we're talking about the plants as when we're just quietly, you know, sensing the awe of the moment and feeling the reverence of being surrounded by natural beauty. So I became a forest bathing guide. I went to Japan. I went on a forest bathing trip um, to Japan where I went on walks led by Shindin Yoku guides, uh, some of the people who had started the practice. And um, then I wrote this book, The Joy of Forest Bathing. And since then, I've been leading lots of forest bathing walks. Of course, these are pre-COVID pictures um, of a forest bathing walk in Rock Creek Park. And I've discovered all of these amazing new parts of the city. This is a walk that I led for Friends of Oxen Run. Um, this is uh, Oxen Cove. It's where Oxen Run runs into the Potomac River. And we just had a wonderful time there on a forest bathing rock. You can see we picked up these smooth stones. We were holding them to our faces. We were holding them to our hearts. It was really wonderful. And I love leading forest bathing walks in improbable places, like the garden behind the Smithsonian Castle and among the bonsai trees at the National Arboretum. And in non-COVID times, I lead forest bathing walks um, for the U.S. Botanic Garden. Libby very sweetly named these walks Botanical Bliss Walks. 
And this is a little map of the uh, National Garden, which is the garden inside the conservatory. I love this garden and it's perfect for forest bathing and also for yoga. They have yoga classes there. So now that we're in this uh, strange new reality, one of the things that, that I kind of think of as the silver lining is that a lot of people who don't ordinarily connect with nature are connecting with nature now. And here in the Washington area, it's really an embarrassment of riches. We have so much cultivated beauty in our gardens, our arboretum, our botanic garden, the cherry blossoms. Um, we have so much cultivated beauty. We also have wild beauty all around us, along the Potomac River and the Anacostia River and Rock Creek and all the creeks that run into the rivers. We have, we just have so much green space around us. We are really lucky. And I think a lot of people during this time are discovering that. And they're discovering that there is drama all around us. You know, when you can't go to the movies and you can't go to restaurants or even to your workplace, I think, you know, turning to nature is something that a lot of people have been doing. And, and it's, it's, like I said, it's a silver lining. One thing I always recommend to people is that you adopt a wild home. And um, my wild home, I'm gonna be talking about one of my wild homes today, which is Theodore Roosevelt Island. I have another wild home, Rock Creek Park, and, and my backyard, which I have connected with so much more during this pandemic. My husband, Jim, and I have gotten to know this toad. We've, we've named the toad Seamus. And the toad lives in the cellar hole next to our front door. And every time we go out or, or come back in, we look for Seamus, we talk to Seamus. Seamus will cock his or her head when we're talking. Um, there's also a rabbit in the backyard that an Eastern cottontail that has grown up from a little baby bunny to almost an adult. And we've named the rabbit Clover. And um, you know, a wild home can be any place that's close to you. It can be your backyard, it can be your porch, your balcony, um, a park down the street, just someplace close to where you live that you can visit a lot and really get to know intimately. And I wrote another book earlier this year called Resilience, Connecting with Nature in a Time of Crisis, and I interviewed a lot of friends all around the country. And one of them was Sadie Dingfelder, who lives in a densely urban part of Washington near Nats Park. Her wild home became her balcony. She's a writer and she would write looking out to her balcony or sitting on her balcony and she made friends with this pair of pigeons that she would then see out and about in the neighborhood. And you can see on the right just how friendly they became. <laughs> you may recognize these um, byline from um, the Washington Post. <clears throat> so enough introduction. Here we are about to walk over the footbridge to Theodore Roosevelt Island. I love this welcome to the island. You come either, if you come in your car, you park um, in a parking lot on the Virginia shore. You can ride your bicycle along the Mount Vernon Trail to get here. And then you walk across this footbridge over a little river. I'm gonna show you a little river on a map in a minute. And, and you arrive at the island, there are no cars allowed on the island, not even bicycles are allowed on the island. And so it is a real refuge and it's right in the middle of Washington, DC. The island is, it's an 88 and a half acre island and it's administered by the National Park Service. As a welcome on the left of the bridge is this beautiful oak tree, it's called a Bartram's Oak. It's a hybrid of a willow oak and a red oak. And there's a new wayside sign welcoming you as well. Um, the title of it is Force of Nature, and it's all about Theodore Roosevelt, the conservationist. Here is a photograph that was taken before the Theodore Roosevelt Bridge, the big bridge from Washington to Virginia, and even before the, um, and before the footbridge, which wasn't built until the 70s. So you can see where the island is tucked in between the Georgetown shore and Roslyn. And if you look to the right, you know, kind of the bottom right hand corner, you see another little island that is called Little Island. And um, the, the river, uh, the Potomac River, when it splits to go around the island, the larger channel on the right that's on the Georgetown side is called Georgetown Channel. 
Then the smaller river on the left-hand side is called Little River. So we have Little River and Little Island. The island is the southern part of the Potomac Gorge, which starts up at Great Falls. This is one of the most biodiverse places in the country. Um, it, it's, you know, there are all these um, rare habitats, all kinds of rare plants, Midwestern plants. The river drains a vast watershed and many plants come down and um, the, the, the animal life and the plant life is incredibly diverse in the Potomac Gorge. So I'm going to mostly be talking about nature today, and, and I hope like helping you to immerse yourself in the beauty of this place. I do want to talk a little bit about the history, just give you a little thumbnail. So um, there was Native American presence on the island for thousands of years, and the Nacotchtank people, who you may know from the Anacostia River because they had a big, big uh, village along the Anacostia River, they lived on the island until um, the 18th century, the early part of the 18th century. And this is just a rich area for many tribes um, to come and fish and forage and hunt and trade. And also um, they, they grew a lot of crops along the river too. So this was just a, a very, this, this whole area and the island sits right in the middle of it. It was, was just a very, very important place for, for Native American tribes. Um, now, the island has had many names. It was called Anilostin Island, Anacostine Island. Um, then the family of George Mason owned the island starting in um, 1717 and for more than 100 years. Uh, George Mason um, was the author of the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which served as a template for the um, US Bill of Rights. And, you know, he was a very prominent individual and a very prominent family. His father bought the island, he inherited it, and then his son John built this very elaborate classical mansion there that you see on the right. And this is the island back in John Mason's time, like from the 1790s through the early part of the next century. Um, you can see it's, it's cultivated end to end. He had a plantation, he had orchards, all kinds of gardens and, and it was really a beauty spot and it was a place that, you know, that the upper crust of Washington came to. They did have um, enslaved people living on the island and working on the island during the Mason era. The Masons started a ferry that went from Georgetown to, this is the northeastern part of the island, and then, um, and they, they started the ferry, I think in 1748, and then they built a causeway from the island to Virginia. So you could take a ferry to the island and then take the causeway to Virginia. That's what James Madison did during the War of 1812 in 1814 when, when the British burned the city. He escaped the city uh, along this route. And one of the things that's really cool on the island is that the old path that's more than 200 years old that goes from the ferry to the remains of the causeway, and you can see where the causeway was until the seven, 1970s. You walk along it, and you know you know that this path was over 200 years old, and you can just kind of feel it. Lots of recreational, you know, there were a lot of different owners after the Masons, um, and lots of recreation on the island of all types, including some of the shadier things like gambling. Jousting was a popular thing on the island in the jousting era. During the Civil War, the first U.S. colored troops trained on the island. This is one of the new wayside signs on the island, and um, you, you see the you see the chair on the bottom. And the reason that Roosevelt is there is that they all fought in the Spanish-American War. Many of the many of the troops um, that are pictured here, and also, of course, Roosevelt's Rough Riders. In um, the 1930s, I think in 1931. The Roosevelt Memorial Association, which is now named the Theodore Roosevelt Association, purchased the island to create a memorial for Roosevelt. And because Roosevelt was a conservationist and a naturalist, this seemed like a very um, fitting memorial for him. They engaged Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., who worked with the CCC and planted over 20,000 trees and shrubs on the island. It, it, the island had really fallen into disrepair, and this was an attempt to return it to a more natural state. And then they turned it over to the government. 
then this um, statue and plaza were created. The architect was Eric Googler, the sculptor was Paul Manship, um, and this is right in the center of the island, this giant statue of Roosevelt with a moat around it. I'm not sure how he would feel about it. Um, <laughs> I think he would enjoy the wilder parts of the island more, and you can see here how big that statue is. <laughs> it's very imposing. Um, <laughs> So um, just to talk a little bit about Roosevelt, the conservationist, which this island memorializes. When he was president, he preserved 230 million acres of public land, and this included pub, uh, national parks, national monuments, um, wildlife refuges, bird preserves. He started the U.S. Forest Service. He, he just had a huge impact. And he was very creative in saving land. If, if Congress would not allow him to create a national park, he would create a national monument. That's what he did with the Grand Canyon, which later became a national park. He um, really had a huge impact. He was president from 1901 to 1909. This is another wayside sign. And these wayside signs were created by Friends of Theodore Roosevelt Island the Theodore Roosevelt Association and the National Park Service, they all work together to um, maintain the island and, and to um, have education projects and all sorts of things going on. Roosevelt was a serious lifelong naturalist from the time he was a little boy. I think when he was eight, he started the Roosevelt Museum of Natural History in his house. <laughs> and. Um, he, you can't really see it here, but there's a drawing right under the picture of him as a boy. There's a drawing of a shrew that he did. It's a, a really good drawing that he did as a young child. He loved birds and he had very poor eyesight. He wrote about birds frequently and mostly he wrote about their songs. This is the white-throated sparrow. Now this adorable bird flies north to um, nest in New England and Canada and points north of here. But then the white-throated sparrow comes back to spend the winter with us. So we get to hear it singing all winter. And Roosevelt described the song as singularly sweet and plaintive, which is just perfect, perfect description. Around the statue of Roosevelt, there are these four pillars. Um, with, with quotes of his. Um, this is the nature pillar, that's the one I gravitate toward. There's one called manhood, one called youth, and one called the state. Roosevelt, in the words of my friend Clay Jenkinson, was the readingest and writingest of all of our presidents. He wrote more than 30 books. He was an incredible writer. He was so well educated and so well read. Um, and on the nature pillar are some of his quotes about nature. And this is one of my favorite quotes of his. There are no words that can tell the hidden spirit of the wilderness, that can reveal its mystery, its melancholy, and its charm. So I think, you know, a lot of people know Roosevelt was a conservationist. Fewer know that he was a naturalist. And I don't think many at all know what, a nature, what an amazing nature writer he was. This is a map of the island um, created by Friends of Theodore Roosevelt Island. I love this map. You can see the trail network. There are more than two miles of trails. The trails are named. Um, there's the footbridge over Little River and um, the Roosevelt Bridge. And you can see Little Island to the right. Uh, little River is not labeled um, with words, but um, Little Island is. And then there's the plaza in the middle um, where the statue is. And they do all kinds of education efforts. Um, uh, the Friends of Theodore Roosevelt Island, they published these bird books with Gary House's um, beautiful photographs in them. And they do a lot of invasive plant removal. This was a um, Martin Luther King Jr. Day um, uh, English ivy removal project this, this past winter. Okay, so I wanna talk about some of the things that I especially love about the island. One of the coolest things about it is that it's right on the fall line. Georgetown and later Washington, D.C. grew up on the fall line, as did most big major East Coast cities, because that was the last navigable point on the river before it got rocky. So this is where the city grew up. Now, when you're on the northern end of the island, 
which are, these two pictures are on the left, you are in the Piedmont zone, the Piedmont zone, and that's the hilly zone that goes between the coastal plain and the mountains. But when you get to the southern end of the island, it's coastal plain. So you go from this rocky, hilly terrain to where it flattens out and, and is coastal plain. And the coastal plain goes flatly over to the eastern shore. Another thing I love, which is related to the topography, is the tides. The river is tidal here. And the tides rise and fall quite dramatically. This is a tidal inlet. And you can see on the left is high tide. On the right is low tide. Look how different that landscape is. And it affects the birds. It affects your whole experience of being there. So when I go to the island, one of the first things I do is I, I check the tide chart on my phone to see is the tide high or low? Is it ebbing or flowing? And that affects my experience being on the island. And I love the trees. I have named this tree Grandmother Sycamore. She is my dear friend. Whenever I am feeling blue or low or worried or anxious, I go sit at the base of grandmother. Here, I, I took this picture from my kayak and this one as well. It's another view of grandmother Sycamore. And you can see her from the Key Bridge, um, looking down to the island and all along the Mount Vernon uh, bike path as you're coming down the path, you can look over and you'll see this beautiful tree with the whitened limbs. It's grandmother and there are a lot of other sycamores along the shore too, but, but grandmother is the most, most amazing. So when you paddle along the western shore of the island and when, you know, when you're in Little River, it's a very wild experience because you have these amazing trees, wildflowers, turtles, dragonflies. It almost feels like a little wildlife safari. Then you come around the corner of, of you know, you come around the bend below Little Island and you face right at the Lincoln Memorial and it's such a dramatic view. It's such a contrast. It's really, really cool. It's one of my favorite things to get in a kayak at either Thompson Boat Center or Key Bridge Boathouse and paddle all the way around the island. So you get to see this, you know, really amazing views of the city from your kayak. On the right, this was taken on land, this was taken from the Swamp Boardwalk, is the Kennedy Center, which, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the architecture of the Kennedy Center, but when you have cattails and black willows in the foreground, it really softens the frame. That's how I like to see the Kennedy Center from the island. And here I am like facing right into the memorial and the Washington Monument. Such a cool thing. And then this is one of Gary's wonderful port of Little River looking up to Key Bridge and the spires of Georgetown. So in the summer, you know, the river's just filled with boats. And um, in the spring and fall, the uh, local high school and college crew teams are out practicing on the water. And um, lots of cross country teams train on the, on the island. They're just this, this group from one of the local schools is running across the bridge to the island and they will run on the trails. Um, this was an evening when a uh, little river was just smooth as glass. Here's the Western shore. You know, this is the wild Western shore that I mentioned. Um, this is one of my favorite summer wildflowers, the pickerel weed. These lovely purple flowers, they're often surrounded by butterflies. And this plant has heart-shaped leaves. A lot of the plants growing right along the riverside have either heart-shaped or arrow-shaped leaves. And then this is the eastern shore. You can see there's a yellow uh, flowering plant called sneezeweed on the left and a turtle basking on the right. And I'm just going to read a passage from the book about the sneezeweed and the turtle. So I have just gotten into a kayak in this passage, which I titled Nature Carries On. It was August 10th. <clears throat> I've just gotten into a kayak at Thompson Boat House, um, Thompson Boat Center. And now I'm reading from the book. Once I've crossed the Georgetown Channel, I headed south along the Theodore Roosevelt Island Eastern Shore. 
Out on the river and skirting the island shore, I thought of the Nacotchtank people who resided on the island and all the many native tribes who canoed up and down this river through the ages, hunting, fishing, foraging, and trading, traveling by a method not unlike my own. Strip away the Watergate Hotel, the Kennedy Center, the Lincoln Memorial, and the airplanes zooming overhead, and the feel of paddle dipping and pulling river water would be the same, timeless. I soon spotted a yellow wildflower newly blooming along the shore, an intriguing looking member of the amazing daisy family called sneezeweed. The sneezeweed plants were about four feet tall with leafy wings down their stalks. An orange brown butterfly was busily nectaring on one of the flower heads. Sneezeweed didn't get its name because of late summer and early fall allergies. The major culprit there is the wind pollinated ragweed. That nectaring butterfly was a dead giveaway that sneezeweed is an insect plant. Rather, the name refers to a form of snuff that was historically made from the leaves and flowers of the plant. Snuff that was created to deliberately induce the sneezing that was believed to expel disease agents and evil spirits from the body, thus curing the common cold. Paddling toward Little Island, past the white barked sycamores, the cinnamon colored river birches, the delicately leafed black willows and the slender and sinewy mussel woods, I came upon a log jutting into the river on which several turtles of various sizes and ages were basking. Some looked fully relaxed and drunk on sunlight and some had their hind and forefeet sticking out at uncomfortable looking angles rigidly held in place in midair. I paddled as close to their yellow striped faces as I could get, too close, and they began plopping one by one into the Potomac, some skittishly quick to dive, some reluctantly leaving the log, and one old geezer staying put, and that's the geezer right there. <laughs> I got close enough to the geezer to identify him or her as a northern red-bellied turtle. I may be botanically oriented, but I'm also a herpetologist wannabe with a deep fascination for turtles and snakes. So um, I think Gary has just captured the grace and the magnificence of this great egret incredibly well. And I had to choose from a lot of his beautiful egret photos. This photo was taken about two weeks ago by my friend Terry Markle, who went to the island at dawn. I think actually she got there before dawn and captured this great blue heron out fishing in the Georgetown Channel. So I'm gonna take you on a little trip through the seasons. Um, I, I, I need to do a quick time check here to see what I have time for us, we're good. Um, so I think my favorite trail on the island is um, the Swamp Boardwalk. And it goes through a silver maple swamp and then out into an open tidal marsh. And it's just a wonderful walk along the boardwalk. And I, I always love to see what's fallen onto the boardwalk. So on the left, you have the winged seeds or samaras of a box elder tree, which is a type of maple. And on the right, I was very heartened to see these uh, Samaras from a green ash tree. As a lot of you may know, um, the emerald ash borer, which is an invasive insect, um, you know, non-native insect, has wreaked havoc on our ash trees, and a lot of the trees on the island have died. So whenever I see a living tree and when I see seeds from the living tree, I'm always incredibly heartened. There is wild rice growing along the boardwalk. There are wild oats and rye and all kinds of wildflowers. Um, the purple flowers are New York ironweed, very dramatic. I took this picture last week, so these flowers are still blooming now. On the upper left-hand corner is a flower called Virginia Dayflower, and um, it's just the most beautiful blue. You can see it's the same blue as the sky with just a hint of purple in blue. 
And then in the low left hand corner is um, an arrowwood plant. <clears throat> and you can see it's got arrow shaped leaves. So walking along the boardwalk, the swamp boardwalk, all through the warmer months, you see incredible wildflowers. On the left is a swamp rose that's um, blooming on a um, rock outcrop, you know, one of those rock outcrops I showed you, I think right near where the great blue heron was. Um, now, now there are rose hips all over the plant. Um, and that flower is very fragrant. I moved in in my kayak, paddled as close as I could get so that I could smell it. And then on the right is a cardinal flower, which is one of our most glorious native wildflowers. I'd like to read another passage. This is from Theodore Roosevelt's autobiography. And for those who know he's a naturalist, he's, he's much better now as a birder. However, I'm going to read this passage, which shows how much he loved wildflowers. Long Island, which is the location of Roosevelt's beloved home, Sagamore Hill, is not as rich in flowers as the Valley of the Hudson, yet there are many. Early in April, there is one hillside near us, which glows like a tender flame with the white of the bloodroot. About the same time, we find the shy mayflower, the trailing arbutus, and although we rarely pick wildflowers, one member of the household always plucks a little bunch of mayflowers to send to a friend working in Panama, whose soul hungers for the northern spring. Then there are the shadow and delicate anemones, about the time of the cherry blossoms. The brief glory of the apple orchards follows. And then the thronging dogwoods fill the forest with their radiance. And so flowers follow flowers until the springtime thunder closes with the laurel and the evanescent honey sweet locust bloom. The late summer flowers follow the flaunting lilies and cardinal flowers and marshmallows and pale beech rosemary and the golden rod and the asters when the afternoons shorten and we had we again begin to think of fires in the wide fireplaces he was a nature writer and he loved wildflowers <laughs> so here are some of gary's photos of the wildlife on the island the deer the osprey i write about osprey a lot in my book i i just love to see them and see them diving into the my catching fish carrying them up into the trees to devour um the bald eagles i saw when i was kayaking last week saw two bald eagles this bald eagle has is carrying a fish gary photographed a whole sequence of that bald eagle snatching that fish from a spray and i love this picture of wood ducks because we always extol the male wood duck, which is just improbably colorful and beautiful. However, look how beautiful the female is too. She's got that beautiful white eyeliner. I love this picture because it really honors the beauty of the female wood duck as well as the male. The squirrels are so much fun to watch up in the, especially on the swamp boardwalk where they're eating all kinds of Samaras and seeds and things are flying and they're running around and carrying on <clears throat> and the autumn season is absolutely beautiful at the island these are vines of poison ivy and virginia creeper which which climb the trees and they're brilliant colors of red and orange <clears throat> i write in the book that it reminds me of red ribbon like like the trees are tied with ribbon and it really looks like that when you're out in your kayak and you look and you see the forest, which is, you know, green and gold, and then these brilliant ribbons going up the trees. And I think of in autumn, every step you take, you're walking through art. The leaves fall, you know, from one day to the next. If you, if you walk in the same place over and over again, you'll see a different tapestry every time you walk, every step you take. This is the inlet in autumn, and that, that um, rusty colored tree on the right is a bald cypress tree, which is a, a coniferous tree that actually loses its needles in the fall. And here it is in the summertime on the left. And those are the cones on the right. They are 
They are what we call sessile, which means they have no stalks. They're just growing right on the twig. When those cones are mature and when they start to break up and fall, they are so fragrant. I urge you, if you are near a bald cypress tree with mature cones, pick one up and smell it. It is the most delightful fragrance. It's very citrusy. Um, these trees grow in southern swamps. You know, this is the tree of the, the Everglades and the, you know, the, um, so, you know, the southern swamps. But they grow as far north as um, the Battle Creek Cypress Swamp in um, just about 50 miles from here in, in Calvert County. And, um, and when they have done various construction projects in Washington, they've uncovered remains of, of cypress trees from, from long, long ago. So this was once a cypress swamp, even though the trees on the island were planted. And they have um, what are called knees <laughs> growing up around them that stabilize them in a, a swampy environment. And I love the picture on the right because it's, I, I titled this photograph, Feet and Knees. <laughs> That's uh, those people are my friends are standing on the on the boardwalk above the cypress. Nest. One of the really fun things to do when tide is um, rising is to watch it rise on the knees. You can see it rising if, if you watch the knees. There are Osage orange trees on the island. They're not native. They're naturalized. Those big fruits. It's surmised evolved along with the mastodons and the mammoths. They're, they're, they're you know, big megafauna ate those fruits. <laughs> um, they were planted, they had, they, the tree has thorns and it was planted as a, a living fence. So it's escaped from cultivation in a lot of places. It's native to Texas and Arizona, Oklahoma. Here's Little River um, in the fall, the shoreline of Little River up in the Piedmont the northern end of the island. And I love the, late, the muted late autumn colors, the, the asters, the uh, rose mallow capsules, and just the, the muted colors of late autumn. <clears throat> In my book, I describe um, cattails when they go to seed and they have these fluffy hairs attached to the seeds. It's like champagne popping out of a cork. Now, when those fluffy seeds are flying through the air, if you catch one in your hand, and close your eyes. They are so light, you literally cannot feel them touching your hand. This is the footbridge to Roslyn um, from the island. And then the winter is one of my favorite times on the island. Um, vistas open up, and, and I, you know, I grew up in Vermont, and I love the winter time. And I, you know, winter beauty really feels nourishing to me. And I love it when the Potomac freezes up. This was a walk that I led from some, for some descendants of Roosevelt. And you may have noticed I don't call him Teddy because he didn't like to Teddy. That was the pet name his first wife had for him and he did not, he did not want to be called Teddy. So Roosevelt scholars call him TR. The man in the black jacket is TR's great-grandson, Tweed Roosevelt. And then the woman in the green jacket um, next to him is Susan Roosevelt Weld, who's Roosevelt's great-granddaughter. The young man in the front is um, Winthrop Roosevelt, Tweed's son, so he is Roosevelt's great-great-grandson. The woman bending down is Nicole Goldstein. She's on the board of Friends of Theodore Roosevelt Island. And the young man in the back is from um, Congressman French Hill's um, office. And what we're doing is looking at, uh, Winthrop noticed some um, beaver tracks. The tide was very low as we walked and he noticed some beaver tracks in the mudflats. So I, I just thought it was so cool to get a photograph of descendants of Theodore Roosevelt fascinated by some beaver tracks in the mud. On this walk, we talked about whether Roosevelt ever visited the island. There's no proof that he did. The island was not a, you know, an incredibly pristine destination at that point when he was president in the beginning of the 20th century. However, Roosevelt, when he was president, he tramped all over, up and down the Potomac, up and down Rock Creek. He was famous for dragging his friends and colleagues on these 12 mile tramps through the rain and the mud. Um, sometimes they would swim naked to cross a creek or river. Um, 
There is one passage in um, uh, Ambassador Jusseron's autobiography called What Me Befell. And Jusseron was one of Roosevelt's buddies in uh, you know, these adventures. And, Rose and Jusseron describes being dragged by Roosevelt in the rain to this island near the White House. And I've read the passage, and, and I think that what, where they went was actually Haynes Point and the Tidal Basin when they were first being formed. You know, they were dredged up from the river. That's all reclaimed land. And it wasn't fully formed yet. And I think that's where they were. I don't think they were on Theodore Roosevelt Island. So we don't really know if, if he went to the island or not. Uh, this is a lovely late winter snowfall. His grandmother in the wintertime. Now, I do have, you know, although the book is mostly a joyful love letter to Theodore Roosevelt Island, um, I do have, you know, some threads running through it of, you know, real concern. This was a time of great upheaval in our country from 2016 to 2017. Um, and also, I coined this phrase phonology anxiety. Um, phonology is the, is the science of the time nature. So, it's when do flowers bloom? When do birds migrate and nest? Everything is intricately timed in nature and tied to the seasons, which have been pretty stable for the last 10,000 years. During my year of record, we had a really weird early spring and early March. It got so warm that all the magnolias bloomed, um, the cherry blossoms started to come out, the wildflowers were out, and then we had a deep freeze and everything froze. The magnolias turned brown. A lot of the cherry blossom buds were blighted. And people were really feeling anxious. You know, people who weren't normally tuned into nature were noticing. So I coined this phrase, phenology anxiety, and I wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post. I was very relieved when a real spring came, when we got through this really um, tense period of, of things freezing. Um, and, and then the bluebells, which had bloomed, you know, they just got their leaves singed a little bit, but then they came back and bloomed at a more normal time. And the early wildflowers on the island are spectacular. The spring beauties and the trout lilies come up right through the rocks practically. You know, they look so delicate, but that's very deceptive. And here's a type of trillium. I love the name, toad shade trillium. The yellow flower is lesser celandine. That is a very bad invasive um, that carpets the ground on the island and a lot of our parkland. And um, I was so happy to see how well the wildflowers did, even in spite of that. The subtle beauty of the early spring trees um, along the river is incredible. The, on the left, that's a, a American elm. Those are the winged seeds called Samaras of the American elm. On the right, I think Gary really captured the muscle wood. You can see that trunk that looks very sinewy and muscular. The red bud blooms in the spring. We have a lot of reptile friends on the island. Um, that's an Eastern rat snake in the middle. Just had a name change from black rat snake to Eastern rats, rat snake. Um, that's a box turtle on the right, which I have never seen on the island. And I'm really happy that Gary has. So I will keep my eyes peeled for them. And on the left is a five-line skink, which is a little teeny lizard that you can see scooting along the boardwalk. These two gentlemen are my brother-in-law, Hill Anderson, on the left, and my dad, Mike Chukas, on the right, who is with us now. They were here visiting from New England on an early spring day. You can see the Kennedy Center in the background. Hill is a Tai Chi practitioner, and my sister, Ellie Anderson, is as well. And Ellie and Hill went off and practiced Tai Chi on the boardwalk platform near the bald cypresses. And my dad was in birding with great blue herons and wood ducks and all kinds of birds. And there's another little rocky outcrop um, beyond Little Island toward the Memorial Bridge. You only see it in low tide. In high tide, it's submerged. And in low tide, it's always covered with cormorants. And I have a funny story that I relay in the book, and I just have to tell it since my dad and my sister and brother are on this call from New England. <laughs> and this is one of our, you know, this is in our family lore. Um, my dad is a lifelong birder. 
And my grandfather, who grew up in Maine, retired to Maine way down east, about as far down east as you can go. And my grandmother had a telescope to kind of keep track of the neighbors. My dad used the telescope for birding, and he would get very excited when he saw birds. My grandfather called cormorants shags, and he would say to my dad, um, why, are you, why are you wasting your time? A shag's a shag. <laughs> So that just became a catchphrase in our family, a shag's a shag. Um, there was a 50th anniversary celebration on, in October of 2017. Yikes, I'm running out of time here, I just noticed. So I'm gonna speed things up. Um, we had, a, there was a tent and um, that's Clay Jenkinson on the left, who's a really wonderful TR historian. Teed Roosevelt, Tweed Roosevelt on the right. They both spoke at the anniversary. They had, we had these very cool cupcakes. And Joe Wiegand, who's an amazing TR impersonator. Um, and there were a tree, I, I led a tree tour. We had a bird walk. It was, it was a wonderful celebration, even though it was pouring rain. Um, the cottonwoods on the island that you can see, I took this picture last week, the leaves are just starting to turn yellow. A really cool thing is that this same cottonwood grows out in the Dakota Badlands where Roosevelt went as a young man, originally to hunt bison, and then he purchased two cattle ranches. When he was 25 years old, his wife and mother died on the same day, on Valentine's Day of 1884, and he went out to the Dakota Territory for quite a while um, and cattle ranched. And, and was um, living among the cottonwood trees that are the same species as the ones that are on Theodore Roosevelt Island. Theodore Roosevelt National Park is one of the best kept secrets in the country. Um, and um, there, are, there's a, there are bison herds in both the south and north units of the park. This is the Little Missouri River that runs right through it. Um, very dramatic, beautiful countryside. And this is off topic, but I just had to include this. There is, a, at the visitor center, there's a little museum. And you may know that Roosevelt was shot in the chest when he was running in 1912 as, as the bull moose candidate. He was shot in the chest in Milwaukee. He kept talking for almost an hour after being shot in the chest. This undershirt of his, you can still see the bullet hole and the blood on the shirt. They have it there in the museum. So I just wanna close by talking about how comforting it is for me and, and I'm sure for you as well to be connected with nature during this time. Um, this is my friend, uh, Stephanie Mason. She's the senior naturalist at the Audubon Naturalist Society. And she said, you don't have to mind social distancing with a violet. You can bend down and peer into its flowering face and breathe deeply of its scent. These are tools of the trade. My friend Carol Bergman, who was for many years the botanist um, and ecologist for Montgomery County Parks, says you can't have too many field guides. And I couldn't agree with her more. On the right are my binoculars, my beat up field guides have spent a lot of time in the field. And on the left are um, hand lenses so that you can look at um, parts of plants up close. Children need to be in nature, they, especially now when they are spending so much time looking at screens, how whenever you can get out in nature is wonderful for children. One of the things that's kept me sane are my friends who share their photographs and their nature experiences with me through texting and emailing and calling. On the left is my friend Sandy Willen, on the right is Terry Markle who took that amazing Dawn picture of a great blue heron. They sustain me with nature photos and, and reports all through the spring and summer. And you know, one thing you can do, you know, even if you're indoors at your desk, is just take a moment to imagine that you're in a beautiful place that you love and just go there and spend a few moments connecting with the beauty of that place in your mind. I wanna close with this quote from Roosevelt. It is an incalculable added pleasure to anyone's sum of happiness if he or she grows to know even slightly and imperfectly how to read and enjoy the wonder book of nature. So thank you so much to the Botanic Garden, to Libby and to all of you for spending your, your lunch hour 
on theodore roosevelt island with me.